Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this day and all the gifts that it holds for us, for this music, for this fellowship, for this place, for our time together, and mostly for your word. God, we pray that as we gather around your word in a special way now, that the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Invite you to imagine for a moment, and if you want to shut your eyes, you can, but just imagine for a moment that you are in a hospital room and there's a tremendous flurry of activity going on around you. Some staff are rushing in with equipment to take new measurements. Other staff are rushing out, having obtained their necessary data. And yet, in the midst of all of that loud and bustling busyness, you're oddly oblivious, not fully registering everything that's going on. In, in part, you're emotionally and physically spent the last few hours and even days have been quite difficult. But you're also distracted by your own joy and elation. The nine months of waiting are over. And a sense of peace and calm comes upon you as the nurse holds you a warm, hands you a warm blanket that's bundling your brand new baby. Healthy baby. With all ten fingers and toes. And you're holding that child for the first time. You can open your eyes if you want. But now imagine that another thought comes across your mind as you're holding this newborn child of yours. How will you share the news with those family members in the waiting room that weren't allowed to come into the labor and delivery room? How will you share that news with your relatives across the country waiting for an update as soon as they can get one? How do you share the news with all of your friends, the wider world. How will you announce the birth of your baby? Well, if it's 51 years ago, you live in Ann Arbor, you're my mom and dad, you call the local paper and say, son, December 3rd, Michael Edwin, born to Mr. and Mrs. Thomas M. Karunas, comma, 2609 Lillian. That's it, right? Short and sweet, perfunctory, just the facts, not even complete sentences. Today, it's a little different, isn't it? Thanks to social media, we don't even wait for the birth to announce something. We, we announce the expectation of a birth. Pinterest, in case you're interested, has all kinds of templates for a charge, of course, that you can customize your announcement. Some of the, them use props, and even the family pets can play a role in these announcements. That's not to say that parents today are more joyful than parents of decades ago. Maybe it is that we're more public with our feelings. That's certainly possible. But I would suggest that whether we're public or we're private with our emotions, one thing is universally true and spans all the generations when it comes to the birth of a child, and that is hope. Hope that we place in the child. Hopes that we have for the child. In, in bygone generations, it may have been the simple hope that the child survives infancy. Or it may be something very personal. 
Let the, the, the child, the hope that the child carries on a family business or one day inherits the family land or continues a family legacy. Or it may be as common as simply hoping that the child has an easier time of things than the parent did. Maybe parents think of that often. I just want my child, I hope that my child has a better chance in life than I did. Regardless of what that hope may be, what the generation may be, all children, in order to receive that hope, must make a journey from darkness to light. Literally. Childbirth is leaving the darkness of the womb and meeting the bright lights of the tangible world. And it just so happens that 2,700 years ago, another journey was made from darkness to light. Another birth announcement was made. But what was unique about that birth announcement is that it wasn't about our hopes for the child that mattered. It was about how we have hope for ourselves because of that child. That's our theme for today. Today is week two of our sermon series entitled The Dreams of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet who had dreams and visions. He shared those with God's people. It gave them hope in their time. But we believe that Isaiah's dreams also prophesied the coming of Christ who gives hope for all of us for all time. And so as we prepare for Christ's coming at Christmas, we're spending one uh, week in December each week on one of Isaiah's dreams because we believe they will help us receive the hope that he brings when he comes. And a recap of last week, very brief. If you were here, great. If you were not, we covered last week the first dream. And last week we said that the people of God were in turmoil. They were in upheaval and chaos and uncertainty and crisis. They had turned away from God and followed their own self-interest. And that landed them in this tumultuous time. Infighting, schism, division, civil war even. The ground that they stood on was very tenuous, shaky. And so in that, in that context, Isaiah came with a dream to give them hope. And in his dream, he showed them that God is in control and God stands above the chaos. And that when the people come back to God, peace will come upon them again. Nice, hopeful message. The problem was things didn't get better right away. In fact, they seemed to get worse. Even as Isaiah was communicating that dream, an, an, an invading army came in from the north and conquered part of the kingdom, subjugated the people, oppressed them. They were forced to live under occupation and oppression in captivity in their own land. And again, their faith wavering, their commitment to God, not real strong, not strong enough confidence shaken. They needed their hope rekindled. And so Isaiah came with another dream. And it's on our scripture reading today is from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 through 7. I invite you to get out your yellow insert. We'll read this together. We'll read our scripture together and we'll start with 2 and we'll stop at verse 5. This is Isaiah's dream spoken to the people, his vision. Let's read it with, with, with one another. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder for the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. We'll stop there. We said that in dream, dreams are intentionally symbolic because they're meant to help people imagine things that are difficult to imagine. And so here, Isaiah is, is infusing hope into the people by showing them that this trial that they're going through, this period, will not last. 
He's showing them a future time when the oppression will be gone, when the invader's gone and things settle and peace comes upon them, that the physical burdens under which they're suffering have been lifted. That's what the terminology about the yoke of the oppressor and the rod and the trampling boots, that that's represents the physical oppression under which the people are suffering. But not only will those things, those physical things be lifted, but also the spiritual and the emotional burdens that go along with them, they will also be lifted. That's what, what Isaiah talks about, the, the despair and, and the uncertainty giving way to joy and celebration and thanksgiving. Like we've just harvested a, a, a treasure that we didn't expect. That's what he envisions. But, and, and his message is that these things that you are suffering right now will not last. And isn't that hard for us when we're going through a difficult time? It feels like it's lasting forever. We don't see an end to the, to the dark tunnel. And Isaiah is saying that's just because our, our perspective needs to change. Like from God's perspective, these things really are temporary. That's why the Apostle Paul would later say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, for we, we do not lose heart, he said, for this slight and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. And the emphasis is on slight and momentary. From God's perspective, these things will end. Right? They will end. So we do not lose heart. Right? They are temporary and they're not greater than God's ability to rise us above them. That's Isaiah's attempt to, sh to, to uh, give the people hope in the midst of their difficulty. And then Isaiah also gives them hope or seeks to by speaking of this journey from darkness to light. He said that the people that were in darkness have seen a great light. They lived in a land of deep darkness. Now on them a light has shined. And it's his way of saying these will not last and we, they will not last these difficulties. And, and, and while we're making this journey from darkness to light, we don't lose hope. We don't give up. Right? We're, 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 he says, yes, we are in darkness now where darkness represents uncertainty and insecurity and the feeling that God is far away. And yes, we, we, we are moving toward the light, where light represents stability and security and safety and dwelling in the presence of God. But it is a journey, and it doesn't happen overnight, and it, and it, and it isn't instantaneous. It's a process that takes time. And he wants the people to hang in there, while God's plans are being fulfilled, God is infinitely more patient than we are. And the, the, the Greek philosopher Plato spoke about the, the, the reason why that, that journey from darkness to light may take time. P Plato said this. He said, imagine that you're living in a dark cave. Has anybody been in a cave before? Caving? I went in Boy Scouts once. Yeah, and, and they shut off all the, the leaders shut off all the flashlights, and they said, put your fingers in front of your nose. And you could not see anything. It was utter darkness. So Plato says, imagine that you're in a cave, and there's one candle that's flickering. That's the only light in this, in this cave that's otherwise surrounded and engulfed in darkness. And he said, if you live in that cave, you know, your eyes adjust to that, that level of light. He said, if you're going to leave the cave and stand in the bright light of day, you have to do that slowly and gradually. Why? Our eyes need time to adjust. Otherwise, if we rush out into the bright light of day, we cannot handle, we will be overwhelmed by the power of the sun's light, which is infinitely greater than the light of a flickering candle. So in order to prepare ourselves for the full weight of this bright light, we have to move slowly. Like Paul says, this momentary affliction is preparing us for the full, the eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. And I believe it's true for all things in life. Spiritual things, relational things, all things. The things that are worth having, that are lasting for our true health and welfare take time. Spiritual maturity doesn't come overnight. It happens over time. Spiritual wisdom doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. 
And maybe that's why childbirth or pregnancy takes nine months in all seriousness. Not nine minutes or nine hours or nine days. That it's God's way of saying everyone, everyone that's receiving this child into the world needs time to prepare for the full weight of the glory of this gift that is given to the world. Isaiah knew that, and that was his, his, his words of hope to this people under, under oppression and affliction. It will not last, and hang in there while God's plans are being fulfilled. But he also knew the power of the birth of a child, and, and, and its power to give us hope. And, and that's that's how his dream ends with these last two verses. So let's read these out loud together. And while you are reading these, raise your hand if you've ever heard these words before. All right? Let's go. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Any hands up? Yes, we've heard this before. And this is nothing more than... A birth announcement, right? Isaiah's birth announcement. Now, in one sense, at an earthly level, he is, he's giving them hope by saying this affliction will not end because God is going to raise up a king who will sit on the throne and drive out the invaders and bring peace to this land again. But we know that Isaiah's dream at a spiritual level prophesies the coming of Christ who is a spiritual king more than an earthly king, an eternal ruler and not a temporary ruler, and one who brings peace to all the world and not just a limited portion of it. And so Isaiah's words here are are essentially Mary and Joseph's birth announcement, not given to the local newspaper, but put in Scripture for all time. Here he is, coming to the world, our son given to us, a child born to us, His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and so on. And oh, by the way, as a P.S. addendum, no baby showers required. No gifts are necessary. Though the Magi will do that, it wasn't necessary. Only, only, only thing is required or desired is that you receive him as your leader. Now, that's not really in Scripture. That's the wonderful counselor part is in Scripture. The part about no, not bringing gifts and accepting him as your leader, that's me adding that. Right? But it might as well be in there because I believe that it fits in with the spirit of Isaiah's dream for this wonderful reason. So these titles, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, mighty God, prince of peace, those were used in ancient times to, to address an earthly king. The king of Assyria might be called the everlasting father and the prince of peace of the Assyrian Empire. And later when the Romans came into power, those titles were applied to the, to the Roman emperor. So decrees Caesar Augustus, everlasting father, prince of peace of the Roman Empire. That's how it would go. So you see, what, what Isaiah is doing here in taking these titles and names that were thought of in one way and using them for Christ, what he's telling us is, here is your king. Here is your source of power. Here is the source of hope. Here is the source of life. Not the political leaders and not the earthly heroes of any generation or any age. Christ is the one who can heal our schisms and our divisions. He is the one who can overcome our willful disobedience and right us in a spirit of grace. He's the one and the only one who can truly lift burdens and give us peace. That's why he would say in his own gospel, Matthew 11, 28 and 30, Come unto me, he said, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Not over there, 
not over there. Come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You come to me. I'll lift that burden from you. I'll share it with you and walk with you and allow you to stand upright in confidence and hope. Advent that we celebrate every year is maybe the most important time of the year. At these four weeks before Christmas, this is how we keep Christ in Christmas, by giving attention to these four weeks. It's a journey we make from darkness to light, from the darkness of our own tendency to follow our own self-interest and turning to the light of Christ and his acceptance and his forgiveness. And really, isn't all of life about that journey? Turning away from the darkness and turning toward the light. And God, God's hope for us, God's children, is that we humble ourselves before that light and confess Christ as our king. That's why we come to church every Sunday. That's why we celebrate Christmas every, every year. Even though it's the same thing. It doesn't change. Spoiler alert, in, in two, two weeks or so, Mary's going to have a baby. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. Shepherds, right? Ox and ass and all these people, wise men, manger, right? But we do that every year. And we come to church every Sunday. Even though we know how the story goes. Because it's our way of turning away from the dark and confessing Christ as king. And that's why what we did today, Claudia mentioned Braylon Wilcoxon. Beautiful baby, beautiful ba not a baby, beautiful young boy. Uh, looked for pictures in the visitor this week from the 9 o'clock service. We dedicated Braylon Wilcoxon. And there's a line at the end of, of the responsive reading that we do for every child that's ever dedicated at Central Christian. We all say together in unison, we look forward to a later point in this child's life when they will confess Christ and be baptized in his name. And really, that's the hope that we should have, the most important hope we can have for our children. And that's what's got, what God's hope for us is, God's children. That whether we're baptized or not, whatever age we are, that we turn from dark to light and confess Christ as our true source of hope and life. Thanks be to God.